I'm sorry. Okay, does this work? Yes? Okay, so good morning, everybody. Uh, so first of all, I want to thank the organizer for the nice invitation, and for, for me, it's the first time I come, I'm coming to Trieste, so it's very nice. Um, and so today, I will talk about uh, amorphous quantum magnet in uh, two-dimensional Rydberger, and I hope that by the end of the talk, you will understand the two parts, which is really this amorphous quantum magnets and how we can or we hope to simulate them with um, Friedberg atoms. And so to present myself, I'm leading the quantum simulation team at Pascal, where we are working on basically proposing like, um, so we are theoreticians first, and we, we want to propose like uh, experimental schemes that can be realized on our platform at Pascal, which are like uh, Friedberg atoms. Uh, and one of the examples is this amorphous material, but we are also interested in other materials. And so to do so, we also develop like a numerical benchmark with like different methods, such as tensor network, quantum Monte Carlo, so many unequal methods as we will see today like in our spin wave. So to outline a bit the talk, I will first like discuss what amorphous materials are, and I will come back from crystals and discuss a bit the difference between these materials and like a crystalline structure, quasi-crystalline structure that maybe some of you are familiar with. Um, then I will discuss a bit more on how we can actually engineer like amorphous quantum magnets that are compatible with our quantum processing units we have one of, where we have van der Waals interaction that they are decaying in one over R6. Um, and then let's, after that, I will discuss about the physics. So first in the ferromagnetic case where we have like uh, um, interaction of the ferromagnetic case. And there what I will show is some of the results that we have done with like uh, um, perturbative approach, like the linear spin wave theory. Um, and then I will discuss like the anti-ferromagnetic case that is also quite interesting, as in these materials we have like geometry frustration, and so we have like this interplay between the anti-ferromagnetism and the geometry that we have here. And finally, I will finish with the conclusion and the outcome. So let's go from crystal to amorphous materials. Um, so like crystalline structures are like materials that have like translational invariance. They have long-range order in the system. Uh, but this long range order can also appear in material that do not have like translational invariance. And this is, for example, the case of quasi crystals where you have no translational invariance, but you still have like uh, long range order in the system. Which means that when you look at the static structure factor of the system, which is really the Fourier transform of your uh, lattice, you will see that there are peaks that are well defined in your materials that are actually there. No? Um, then there are amorphous materials. And in these materials, you don't have long range order, so they look disorder, like at the long range. Nevertheless, when you look like in the short range, you still have an order. And so this will see that this will reflect, for example, on the well-defined like uh, nearest neighbors, like uh, number of nearest neighbors that you're in the system, for example. Um, and so this is really the focus that we will take here, is like how can we actually like engineer this type of materials? Um, so to be a bit more like uh, detailed here, so what I've plot here is uh, the, like uh, different lattices. So we start really like with a, a square lattice that uh, we have here. And so what I plot here is the radial distribution function, which is really like the density of atoms that you have in a radius around the given like atom in your material. And so in the square lattice, because everything is super order, what you see is that you have perfect peaks that are corresponding to the nearest neighbor that you have in your material, the next nearest neighbor, et cetera. No? And so you see that even at long range, you still have like disorder that is well defined. So the, the first thing that you can look at is you take your square lattice, you put a bit of disorder in your system, and you start to look at how these peaks are evolving. Here, due to the fact of the disorder, you have a broadening of the peak that you're observing. You still observe them, but you have like a broadening of these peaks. So. Um, then there is the other extreme case is um, I draw like a random disorder point from a like uniform distribution and would obtain these materials like this. When I look at the like um, the radial distribution function, actually I really see that there like everything is flat, so it's really uniform like in the radius. No? In the case of amorphous, and this is one example of amorphous solids, um, 
what you will have is that in the long range, you will observe like this flat like Q, which is really like typical for like a random distribution. Nevertheless, in the short range, you observe that we have like well-defined peaks that are actually corresponding to like nearest neighbor or next nearest neighbor. So in this sense, you have like short range order, but no long range order in the material. No? And so one of the nice things is that you can also relate like uh, the, so the radial distribution function to the so-called coordination number. The coordination number is basically the number of nearest neighbor that you have in the, in the system. So this defines like the, the short range order. So there is a lot of interest in amorphous solids. Uh, first of all, and this is quite interesting, is that all materials, when you prepare them like in experiments, I mean like really by cooling them down, actually like um, they will become amorphous if you cool them fast enough. So this is uh, interesting. So like in, um, and there were also like quite a lot of interest in like uh, semiconductors because these materials can have gaps. So that these amorphous sem semiconductors have quite a lot of interest. And uh, also like for superconductors because they might have effect also on the critical temperature that you can observe like the superconductor. And then more recently, there have been interest in like uh, a regain of interest like in the last uh, five to 10 years, I would say, um, because of these properties for like topological materials where you can ask yourself whether like this, is this short range order sufficient to actually like generate like uh, topology in the system? And the answer is that yes, you can observe, for example, like topological edge states in these materials. Also very recently, like interest in like uh, spin liquids and like uh, how these uh, spin liquids could also arise in like uh, amorphous materials. So now I will go to amorphous quantum magnets uh, on a neutral atom QPU. And so like here, the idea is really that uh, these materials are in a sense disordered. They are not easy to simulate. Um, and you could really think, okay, from a, a piece of material that I have, like let's say theoretically and from my microscopy Hamiltonian, I have two paths. Now one is to really like go from my microscopy Hamiltonian and use some methods that I have that can be perturbative in some regimes or some other methods like tensor network or quantum Monte Carlo neural quantum state that we have heard a lot yesterday to try to study, for example, like some observables such as the ground state or the dynamics of the system or the other way around, which is really like the quantum simulation way that would be, let's use like a device and here we would use like neutral atoms like um, trapped in optical tweezers to actually study like the ground state or the dynamics of the system. So in the case of uh, the platform that uh, we have at Pascal's, these are Rydberg atoms in, uh, in um, optical tweezers. I mean, um, this has this advantage of the flexibility that you can really like put the atoms wherever you want. And so for example, this is one famous example that they did in the group of Antoine Brouet, um, where they are actually able to draw like famous paintings such as uh, the Joconde. Um, and so this is very nice because in the case of uh, our materials for amorphous, we could really like place the atoms wherever we want and like generate like very complicated or complex geometry that we could do, no? So the other thing is that it's scalable. So in the sense that we can grow to hundreds of atoms or thousands of atoms. And so it's very good for us because here we are actually looking at a phenomenon that is in between. Um, I think it will come back. Yeah. So we're looking at a phenomenon that is in between, which means, um, okay, so it's back. <laughs> which, um, which means that um, we will have like finite size effects but we want to observe something that has short range, but no long range. So, I mean, we, we need to have like systems that are sufficiently large to not have only effects from the boundaries that would actually maybe give like spurious correlation in the system. So this is a very nice thing. And so for example, like this is one of the experiments that they did like also in the group of uh, Antoine Brouet, where they were actually able to, to measure like uh, the correlation of uh, the antiferromagnetic phase and show that this is like reproducing very nicely what you would expect like in terms of the structure factor. Um, then what type of interaction can you have in this system? So here we really have like atoms that are trapped in optical tweezers and then you can, 
by shining a laser, like turn the num to like the Rydberg state. Um, and there you can have two type of regimes that you could have really, that would be like one that would be the Ising model with Van der Waals interaction decaying in one over R6. Or like uh, also if you address like the interaction between two Rydberg states, you can have like the type of XY model that we have with like dipolar interaction that are decaying in one over R cube. Um, so in the case of this proposal and for the platform that we have at Pascal, it's really this type of Ising model that we will look in at. Um, but now like uh, what was interesting when we started to look at the literature is that typically when people study amorphous materials, they consider the so-called like Voronoi tessellation where they start from a random lattice and then there is a procedure to go to like a lattice that is actually uh, amorphous uh, with this kind of uh, Voronoi tessellation. Um, nevertheless, as you can see here, like the distances, some of the, the, let's say the lattice that you have is actually amorphous, but the distances are not like respecting. And in our case, for example, the fact that all these distances are not actually like um, the same means that we will have like for in our interaction that is decaying in one over R6, this is actually a big hurdle. No? So there are ways to actually like get better results in this direction with, for example, this Lloyd tessellation, where you can now like actually squeeze this distribution to have like a, a better ordering in terms of the distances that you would have in the system for the nearest neighbors. Um, but still you see like um, it's interesting to have other algorithms to generate like shapes. One of the reasons being also that here you are really limited to actually three nearest neighbors that you would have in the system. No? So like this Voronoi tessellation always gives you like three nearest neighbors, like, like in, if you look at these graphs. So what we did is to come up to, with an algorithm that would actually allow us to, to do with a variational approach to actually choose like a, the arbitrary number of nearest neighbor in our system. And that can be tailored to the type of interaction that we have here that are actually sh like quickly decaying in one of our SIPs. And so the idea is that we start with a system that is disorder and then we apply some of a kind of a gradient descent procedure to like the minimization of a loss function that is defined here, uh, which is composed of uh, three terms. So basically the first term is the term that you would like to optimize, that is uh, that we fix some of like, the number of nearest neighbors that we would, have, would like to have in our amorphous material, uh, and we try to minimize that. But we have two other terms because we don't want the atom to get too close to each other. So this is this term that is actually avoiding that. And then the last term is that we don't want like the atom to actually like generate clusters of points that would be detached, no? So we have to force them to go like together. No? So this is why you have these three terms. And so um, these parameters, for example, are hyperparameters that you have to fine tune, but uh, by doing so, you can like minimize this function and you are able to actually generate like different types of uh, amorphous material. And here are some examples of materials that you can generate, for example, with coordination number equals to three, where you see that when you zoom in in the material, for example, here in the center, you can really see this kind of hexagonal structure that you would expect for coordination and qual to three, but you see that you also observe this kind of defects that appear here with like plaquettes that are like uh, larger loops actually, no? Um, then you can also generate like coordination number equals to four, which would be like really the type of square lattice equivalent uh, where you also observe this plaquette to four or like even like numbers that are actually not exact, uh, existing in crystals, such as 3.5 that you can have here, or five that are also like ones, that, yes? So actually you can do both. So I think for the Voronoi tessellation, typically you can impose like periodic boundary conditions. Um, but um, but it's like, I would say it's uh, the way you construct it, but then you look at the finite piece of it, no? But it's very, I would say it's very similar to what you do in quasi-crystals, no? In quasi-crystals also, typically when you construct it, you construct it through the periodicized version that you go like larger and larger. So in our case, actually in the, so it's not yet, it will be for the second version on the archive. We actually also studied like periodic. So this is like all open boundary conditions. And so basically what we do is that we run our algorithm, but then we look like basically something in the bulk of the algorithm to avoid like the boundary effects. 
Um, but we also have a version that can be done with periodic boundary condition that is actually useful for like some of the results that I will show later on. Okay, and so, so once you have that, what you can do is that you can look at the, the, the static structure factor, which is really like the, the Fourier transform of your, of your lattice in, uh, in phase space. And so when you look, for example, at this uh, C equals three, so like three nearest neighbors, what you observe is that uh, like the, the static structure factor actually like uh, resemble to what you would have in the, in the hexagonal lattice but you have like this kind of nice range that appears, which is actually also like reflecting the fact that you don't have like, uh, um, I mean, you don't have like a preferred direction in your material anymore, no? Um, and for C equal four, like you have the same type of property. You see that it's a, like a circle around like uh, the typical square lattice that you expect for the Brie on zone two, no? Um, what is interesting is for example, in the case of 3.5, what you observe is like also a ring which is compatible actually to this hexagonal one. And here this interesting thing is that if you are looking at the lattice actually, you will have like a mixing if you want between like some hexagonal rings and Kagome type of rings. No? So in this sense, like this structure factor is like compatible with that. Um, so as you can imagine, these materials are relatively disordered which means that you don't have really a topology in the systems. It's um, difficult to do like, um, it's quite challenging also for like uh, numerical methods to actually like find. So typically what uh, people do like to study, for example, dynamics in, uh, in um, this system, like it's to use, for example, matrix product states. And, but then you have to like take your two dimensional system and to map it to a one dimensional system. And for regular lattices, you can know what is the optimal way to do this mapping. Whereas in this system, it's much more difficult how to define like the indexing of this system. No? Um, the other thing is that you cannot impose like the typical symmetries that you would use such as translational invariance or like uh, other symmetries of this type. The other thing is that for this system, as I mentioned before, there are like uh, important like boundaries effects. So you would need to have large systems, which means like this kind of calculation even more difficult. And then what is also very interesting at the ground state level is uh, in the antiferromagnetic case, you can have like local frustration in the system, and this can make actually like also simulation difficult like for ground state finding with like uh, classical methods. Um, so now I want to, to go a bit to the ferromagnetic case. And I want to discuss a bit what we did, which is like a preliminary study with like linear spin wave analysis to understand a bit like the, the phases that we expect in, in the system. And so here, here what we did is to consider somehow like the, the ferromagnetic interactions in the model. Let's see if it comes back. Um, so you have an Hamiltonian here like with like this interaction that is decaying, like it's ZZ interaction decaying in one over R6. Um, and basically like this type of model is, um, so if you look at the original Hamiltonian, the Rydberg Hamiltonian has, um, anti-ferromagnetic interaction. Nevertheless, like during the dynamics, due to the time reversal symmetry, you can consider like this anti-ferromagnetic interaction or like the ferromagnetic interaction because it's like a time reversal property. Um, so this is why here we can study like some more like the ferromagnetic regime. And so basically what we do here to compare like these different lattices is that we set the minimum distance between the, the two sides somehow to be like uh, a constant, no? Okay, to actually be like able to compare these different ones. And so we consider some of the, the transverse fields here, like, and we will change the transverse field and see a bit how the phase diagram is changing, no? Um, so here what you expect, like by increasing the interaction here is to, so in, in the regime where interaction are somehow low, you would expect um, to, to be in the ferromagnetic phase. And when you increase this interaction, uh, so, sorry, when you increase like the Rabi frequency here, that is the sigma H term of your model, you expect to go to a paramagnetic phase no, where the spins will be aligned in the, like the alien vector of sigma H. No? Um, 
So what you can first do is to do like a, a mean field study of this, uh, this, uh, this model um, by doing somehow like a perturbative approach, like assuming that your, like your spin are still close to sigma z. And you already see here that this is perturbative in the sense that when hx will be large, you don't expect the spins to point in this direction. No? Um, and so if you do that, then um, you will arrive to this uh, effective mean fin energy, which is really like a, a product state one, um, that you would like to minimize. And this you can do like with uh, like a classical minimizer. No? And so from that, you can obtain like the, the mean field uh, energy and the mean field ground state which uh, you can characterize through like uh, the order parameter of the system, which is the magnetization. And so here you expect that in the ferromagnetic phase, as all the spins are pointing in the, X, uh, in the Z direction, you expect to see like a magnetization of one or 0.5, depending on your convention. Here we define like the spin as one half of the sigma Z matrix. Um, whereas in the paramagnetic phase, because you are like an agent set of sigma h, you expect to see like a, a magnetization of zero. And so this is what we did here. We like studied the model for different uh, values of the coordination number. Um, and so what you see is that the transition um, appears a certain value, which is uh, different also from the, a bit different from the one that you would expect for the regular lattice, which is the vertical line that you're observing here. Okay, so then if you want to go like beyond some of this uh, mean field approximation, you can add a correction, which is the linear spin wave theory, which is uh, basically what you do is that you start from your mean field ground state and you add the perturbation. So it's uh, like represented by this holstein primakov mapping when you basically rewrite your spins in terms of the mean value plus a correction to it. And so if you do that and you write now like the Hamiltonian that you would obtain, you will obtain a Hamiltonian now that will be quadratic in terms of this new operator A and A dagger. No? And so the nice thing of this Hamiltonian, it's again quadratic, so you can still diagonalize it through the help of the Borel-Yubov transformation. And so this allows you to obtain like the spectrum and you can also like obtain somehow like an idea of the excitations that you would have like on top of the ground state. So one of the nice things that you can do is that, for example, to cross-check that when you do this type of analysis, you can look at the energy gap between the ground state that we had with the mean field and the first excited state that you obtain through this linear spin wave analysis. And what you see is that at the phase transition point, you always observe that there is like a gap closing in this system. No? Okay, so an another thing that one could wonder is uh, what happens with like somehow the fact that the system has disorder? How can it compare actually to like the disorder that you would add, for example, to a square lattice? And so in this direction, there was a nice work from Tommaso Rochilde that is here, where they were like considering actually like a, a system of a Rydberg array no? in a square lattice, but with disorder. And I wanted to see whether the, like the system has some localization or not, appearing due to the fact that you have some intrinsic disorder in the Rydberg array, like on the position on the tweezers, for example. Um, and so what we wanted to do here is also to see in our system somehow like whether we can have like excitations that are like beyond what you would observe in localized, so like typically like magnons or like what kind of physics we will have here, no? Um, and so the, the first part of the study that we did is to compute this inverse participation ratio which is like an indicator on how localized are your wave functions in your system. Um, and actually you can see like uh, in this plot here is that, uh, that basically when the, the H sheet is sufficiently large, which I insist again is like beyond this perturbative analysis, um, that in this case you can actually have also like uh, delocalized uh, particles now. And so this is also reflected in uh, the so-called dynamical structure factor, which is um, basically like um, a Fourier transform of your two-point correlators in position and in time, which basically gives you information about the energy structure of your, like uh, the energy bands of your system, if you want, in the many-body case. No? 
And so what you can observe is that uh, through this linear spin wave analysis, we still see that there is a band that is appearing somehow like beyond like the, the ground state in the system. And so we expect to observe like this kind of Magnoni dynamics in the system when H, H is sufficiently large. Okay. Then I want to go to the, the other case, which is like the antiferromagnetic case, which is really the one that we would have in the system if we would study the ground state of the system. No? Um, so the first thing that is interesting here is, the, so I told you before, we can generate like a system with coordination number, for example, four, but this does not tell you anything about the angles in your system. No? So you would have like, for example, for coordination four, you have both like, for example, like a square type of, uh, let's say, amorphous material, or you can also have like Kagome type of amorphous materials where you see like these plaquettes and these triangles around like the Kagome. Um, but you see already here that these two materials will have very different ground states. So let's say that if I come back to regular lattices, what we expect to have for square lattice is as the system is well ordered, you expect to have like a nice antiferromagnetic ordering appearing in the system. Uh, whereas in the Kagome lattice, let's say already at the classical level, you expect to have a huge degeneracy of the ground state, um, which is really like the type of uh, spin liquid that you would expect there. And so here, one of the questions that we wanted to address here is a bit, what we will observe here between these two lattices, and especially in the case of the Kagome lattice, whether we could say something about the glassy nature or not, or this type of amorphous materials. No? And so here it's again like interplay between the geometry, the fact that we have frustration to the geometry, and the antiferromagnetic interaction that we have in the system. Um, so to do so, and uh, we used an approach to have like a first uh, benchmark in this direction, which is like uh, using like classical simulated annealing, um, which I want to remind a bit how it works. So the idea is that we do like some simulated annealing and the procedure of simulating annealing is that you do some random signal split, a spin flip in your model. And then you do a metropolis update in a model at a given temperature. And then little by little, by step, you actually reduce the temperature in the model. And so, so what you can do with that is that then you can study some more like um, different replicas, so the different initial conditions that you're utilizing here, like for your your metropolis algorithm. Um, and you can study like different quantities, such as the energy that you would obtain through this simulated annealing, um, or other parameters. Uh, for example, one that is commonly used for spin glass, which is called the Edward Anderson uh, parameter, which is basically written in terms of this QSA of alpha beta, which is basically like for two like simulated annealing ground states you are comparing some of the spins of these two replicas, no? like for the ground state, uh, locally. And then you can also compute some of like this uh, Q square of SA, which is like the mean over like this uh, different replica. No? Um, and so the other thing that you can also do is you can look at this distribution of probability. And typically in the spin glass, this is what people use to actually like characterize what type of spin glass you have like in your system, and how glassy is your system. So to start uh, with that and to give a bit more of intuition because these quantities are not that intuitive, um, we started to look at paradigmatic models. Um, and so actually in the square lattice, as I said before, you expect to have like antiferromagnetic ordering. Um, and actually there are two ground states here. So like, uh, so let's say like for the 1D case, it would be like up, down, up, down, up, down, but you can also have down, up, down, up, down, up, no? So it's really like a full like rotation of all the spins of your model. And so what you expect in this case is that you expect to have like in your probability of this QSA, alpha beta, to actually have two peaks, one at one and one at minus one, because it's exactly like the opposite pattern of the other one. No? So this is what you observe actually like through this simulated analysis. In the case of the Kagome lattice, because the ground state is like totally degenerate, you expect to see somehow a peak at zero, like in this probability distribution. Um, then what you can do also is to study like the same type of uh, 
to do the same type of analysis in the paradigmatic Edward Anderson like uh, model, which is a model with like uh, basically like random coupling, like Ising model with random coupling. Um, and there you can also study two types of models. So one that would be like um, Gaussian, where you have like the Gaussian distribution for your coupling that can be positive or negative, so it's center or on zero. So one of our bimodal. And so what is known for literature is that these two models have actually like different behaviors. No? Um, so here I have to insist that uh, simulated annealing is not a good method to study spin glass. Um, because basically you are not converging to the ground state of the system. So in this case, we're actually converging to the ground state of the system because the system is small. And so if you let the system evolve sufficiently long, you will actually reach the ground state. But in general, you, like a single kind of Monte Carlo update will not allow you to actually like explore properly like the low energy landscape of these spin glasses. Nevertheless, and like in general, this kind of spin glass analysis is very difficult. And so we believe that this simulated annealing is a first step towards this direction to understand whether these phases could be glassy or not. No? But it would require like a proper analysis afterwards. So we did the same type of analysis for amorphous material. So we considered like a, a system with C equal four with 400 sites um, for both like the square and Kagome geometries that I showed you before. Um, and so the first nice thing that you can see here, what I plot is the energy spectrum for different number of steps in your simulated annealing. And what you see is that in both these models and for the different replicas, you see that uh, there is not a nice convergence in terms of the energy, which really reflects that somehow like this algorithm didn't converge there. No? Like, um, so the, this is the first thing like, um, that you, you can observe here. So the, so like on the left, you have actually the square type of lattice, and on the right, you have like the Kagome type of lattice. And the different colors are different number of steps in your algorithm. Um, then the other thing that you can see is that uh, there is uh, actually like a difference when you look at this, uh, this probability of QSA in the case of um, squarish type of amorphous solids and Kagome type of amorphous solids where you actually see that um, in the case of square, you still see that you are coming from these two peaks that were well localized in the like, uh, lattice version, but here you see that they are broadened. Whereas in the case of the Kagome, everything like is around zero, no? So this is like a, a first indication that um, these materials could be glassy at zero temperature. But this would require like a, like a further analysis. And so, I mean, with that I want to to go to the conclusion and the outlook of the talk. So like um, I presented a new algorithm to generate like amorphous layout and which is actually well suited for like our physical platform, which is like these Rydberg atoms. Um, the resulting Hamiltonian that we have are actually hard to tackle numerically and even with state of the art like numerical methods. And we showed like some first benchmark with perturbative methods. So here like the linear spin wave um, Theory, but it would be nice to actually do benchmark with like more like uh, evolved techniques such as tensor network or others. Um, so in this case, like it's really an example where neutral atom quantum simulator could really represent an avenue to study these materials, both for the dynamics or for the ground state properties of the model. And I mean, there is a lot of potential interest in physics that could appear because like, for example, in the last part, I really show like what happens in the classical regime but you could imagine that the interplay also with like uh, a quantum term of the type of uh, Rabi frequency of sigma x would be quite interesting because you might have competition between spin glass and spin liquids or other phases that would appear here. And so like the work that I presented today is on the archive. The last part is not yet on the archive because we will add it in the second version of the paper. Um, and these are my collaborators on this work. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Alexander, for the beautiful talk. Uh, please. Uh, 
<coughs> so you showed that uh, simulated annealing is not uh, working very well for these yes. classical simulations. Have you tried using uh, simulated quantum annealing like in a path integral Monte Carlo? So, so here, all the results that I showed were classical? So yes, yeah. but also simulated quantum annealing is classical. It's a way of simulating quantum annealing through a Markov chain Monte Carlo, basically. It's by using path integral Monte Carlo approach. And I don't know, there are some papers showing that for some cases you do have uh, an advantage over simulated annealing. Like on uh, binary neural networks, for instance, you do have an exponential advantage. So you don't get stuck in uh, order n uh, metastable states, but you can kind of almost converge to the low minima. Okay, so no, we didn't try that. So, I mean, one of the things that is difficult for the spin glass study, and I have to say we are not experts on spin glass, so we <laughs> it was not easy for us. But uh, one of the difficult things is that typically in 2D, spin glass is expected to be only at zero temperature. And so we tried simulated annealing, then we tried a bit also of uh, like parallel tempering, but all this is actually quite difficult because you really want to go to the zero temperature there. Right? Yeah, but in SQA you anneal on the field, on the transverse field that are simulated, so maybe just a, an idea to try. Mm -hmm, yes, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, other questions? Oh. Uh, I would have a question, maybe more on the experimental side. Yes. Um, like, what are you thinking about uh, doing with these uh, amorphous materials? Would you really try to target, say, the ground state via some maybe adiabatic protocol, or would you more like target some actual dynamic, some dynamics you start from some product state, which is probably uh, easy to prepare, and then looking at dynamics? Yeah. So, what do you have in mind a bit uh, in this? So I mean, for the moment, both aspects are open. No? So it could be like to study a bit like this phase diagram and try to probe this kind of uh, glassy physics. But it could also be for dynamics, so where you prepare like your initial state, which is typically in these Rydberg setups where all atoms are in the ground state, so it's a product state. Then you could study, for example, quench dynamics in this system, which is non-trivial. Um, or to probe also like a dynamical structure factor because this should be possible also like on quantum simulators. Is it like now for you also possible maybe to analyze random, initialize random configurations or would they be always um, be uh, identical for each spin, like all spins in the ground state? So, so I will answer in two steps. So the first step is what do we have now, no? So what we have now is we have global addressability. So you can prepare states, but through global pulses, no? So it's not random in this sense. In the future, it's, in principle, we will have also local addressability. Still, you cannot prepare any arbitrary state because you, the underlying Hamiltonian is the one that you have in the system, which is this Rydberg Hamiltonian. But it allows you to do like local preparation of uh, like sigma Z term, for example. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, other questions? Comments? I have one. You have mentioned that the inverse participation ratio of the excitations. Yes. How does it scale with the sides? What kind of localization properties do you find? Yes, yeah, so this is uh, what was plotted here. So we did this scaling analysis here, mm -hmm. and we observed that in some regime, you actually see that you go to a localized regime, so when HX is uh, too small, in a sense, but then it changes when like the system is larger. No? So not kind of transition. I mean, you will have a transition from some localized to delocalized, yes. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. thank you very much. So let's thank Alexander again, and let's go to lunch. <laughs>